This is a CNN report. And as you can see here, it is stated, this is what? This is a horror. And the bottom line says, more than 150 people killed in Paris attacks. As a result, a state of emergency was called. For the past few weeks, we have been going through the book of Daniel. Amen? Looking at this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and the stone hits the image on where? On its feet, and that stone became and will become a whole mountain and fill this whole earth. This is a sign of end time Bible prophecy. And as we look and we're seeing here, do you remember a few days ago, especially on Tuesday and on Thursday for live stream, we looked at the fact the Roman Empire was broken up into 10 different nations because of what primarily? Talk to me. What primarily brought about the division of the ancient Roman Empire into 10 different nations? What brought this about? This was the barbarian tribes. The barbarian tribes broke up the Roman Empire. One whole kingdom, the Roman Empire, was divided into 10 different nations because of the attacks and the sacking of Rome by the barbarians. And we showed from the writings of our pioneers, Stephen Haskell, Uriah Smith, as well as from the historical record, this was the case. And then we showed the word barbarian is synonymous to what word? Terrorists. So if you go back into history, it was the attack of terrorists that brought about the division of the ancient Roman Empire. But the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 2, look with me at verse number 43. The Bible says, And whereas thou sawest, iron mixed with what? Miry clay. So what will be happening in the last days? What two things will be mixing and mingling together? Iron and what? And clay. And the iron represents the papacy, amen? And the clay represents the nations in one sense, amen? And apostate Protestants in these last days. Is the mingling going on right now? And what is the purpose of this mingling? To bring about a one world kingdom, a one world government, a new world order. And we showed on Tuesday evening, as well as on Thursday, since it was the barbarian tribes, terrorism that brought about the division of the ancient Roman Empire. That terrorism will be used in these last days to do what? To bring about the unification of the various nations. What is now taking place in Paris, friends? Look at this. This is, this is Fox News. It says, deadly Paris terror attacks. More than 150 people are believed to be dead. After whom? Who are, they, who are they blaming? After terrorist gunmen conduct a series of coordinated cold-blooded assaults in several crowded sites. Are they blaming terrorists for this attack? It says, uh, act of war. French president responds to attacks. ISIS claims responsibility. Syrian passport found on one of the suicide bombers. Wait a minute. But that means this whole issue of migration of refugees, they are now going to blame for this attack in Paris, friends. You know, friends, I can't give everything God is giving to me right now. Let's wait until a day or two, until the dust settles, and then we can begin to show what this event really means for God's people in these last days. Who are they blaming now, friends? Terrorists. Terrorists. I believe most of these things are fabricated. Amen. Write down in your note paper, write down the book, The Great Controversy, page 500. And 79. Most of these things are fabricated. And these things, terrorism, ISIS, these things are being used to bring about a one world government. This shows us then the iron and the clay are what? Mingling together. And verse 44 
of the second chapter of Daniel says, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom. How close are we to the second coming of Christ, my friends? Do you remember? It was just in January 12, 2015, Charlie Hebdo. What happened there? And what was the aftermath just in January of this year? Array of world leaders joins, what's that word again? Joins 3.7 million people in France for what purpose? To defy terrorism. Who are these men and women in front in the front and center of the crowd here, friends. These are the leaders of the various uh, nations. Are they now holding hands? Hold your place in the second chapter of Daniel. Go to Genesis chapter 16 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Genesis chapter 16. Are they now uniting? And it's not by accident. It happened in France. Friends, bear in mind, it was France that brought about the deadly wound to the papacy in 1798. Why are these significant events happening in the nation of France? Why France? Just in the time, we're in November, what, November 14th? November the 30th begins the Paris summit to combat climate change, where all these nations are, and their leaders are now gathering to sign off on the resolution written by Pope Francis directly and indirectly to unite all nations to combat climate change. And the Pope says uh, the primary thing to stop climate change is for these nations to enforce the Sunday law. Watch this. Just a few hours ago, it says, who is this here, friends, front and center here? Al Gore, climate webcast from Paris suspended after what? The deadly attacks in Paris, France. Genesis chapter 16. Are we there, friends? Verse number 11 speaks about Ishmael and his descendants. And verse number 12 says, and who are the descendants of Ishmael? What religion? What group of people specifically? These are Muslim. This, this is Islam. Verse number 12 says, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. And what, friends? And every man's hand against him. Did that take place in Paris, France, January 12, 2015? The leaders are holding hands saying, let's all unite to defy terrorism. Is, is this bringing about the unification of the iron and the clay, the nations with the papacy. Yes, go with me. Isaiah chapter 59. Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah chapter 59. The Bible tells us, do you believe we're living in the last days? Or do you think I'm crazy? Which one, friends? Do we believe that we're living in the last days? How can we see these things? A fulfillment of Bible prophecy and not realize Christ's coming is even at the doors. The close of probation is about to take place. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59. Are we there, my friends? The Bible tells us in verse number 17 and verse number 18 that this passage of Scripture is addressing the close of human probation. Verse number 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of what? vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak according to their deeds accordingly he will he will repay fury to his adversaries recompense to his enemies is this passage of of scripture addressing the close of probation destruction for unrepentant sinners is this the context of isaiah 59 now, the Bible tells us now that there will be a primary sign that will show us the close of probation is near. A primary sign that shows Jesus Christ is about to come. That primary sign is right here in verse number 14. What verse, my friends? Verse number 14 says, one primary sign, the second coming is near, is that there is going to be inequality. What, friends? Oppression. These things are going to be prevalent in society. All I'm going to do for the next few moments is just show you 
all the various things that happened just this week that again show us probation is about to close. Look at verse 14 with me. Isaiah what chapter? Isaiah 59 verse 14 says, And judgment is turned away how? Backward. And justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and what? Equity cannot enter. So there is going to be inequality there is going to be oppression and the following news report shows us that indeed inequality and oppression even in the area of race and money even in the area of religion oppression is prevalent in society today how many of you heard of what happened on the campus of the university of missouri this week what happened there friends the students were marching, protesting against what they called systemic racism on the campuses all around the country, specifically there in Missouri. Is that clear so far? Listen, no, friends, we weren't there, right? So all we're doing is looking at what the report says. Listen what this says. Headline says, college students across the country stand in what? Solid solidarity with Mizzou. Skip on down. The coalition said they applaud the efforts of Mizzou activists who protested ongoing racial tensions on campus. The demonstrations at Mizzou, which included both faculty and football players, led to the resignation of the president of the campus and also the chancellor of that university it's still prevalent today now look with me at verse number 15. how does god feel about this friends verse number 15 says yea truth faileth and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey and the lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment and he wondered that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor therefore so god is looking for whom intercessors those who will stand for the oppressed and the downtrodden now listen to me carefully i'm not saying that we must join what they call black lives matter friends god is not into white supremacy or black supremacy it's the devil's plan to divide and conquer but should we blind our eyes that prejudice is not alive today in society even in the churches today it's here my friends and now we are seeing that professed seven day adventists are now standing in solidarity with those students on the campus in missouri saying we stand with you yes we are going to dress in all black now my question is my question is friends why were they doing that in the sanctuary of Oakwood's church. Why in the sanctuary? Why in the sanctuary? Friends, hear me carefully. God is not calling us to march and protest. God is our model, right? When Christ lived on the earth, were the people being oppressed? Did Christ side with the oppressors? No. Question, did he side with those who were being oppressed while at the same time they were harboring hate for the oppressors no christ stand in the center why conversion is needed in the hearts of both groups go with me isaiah chapter 42 out of one god came all flesh and the everlasting gospel must go to every nation kindred tongue and people who is bringing separation then friends it's the devil and his agent. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 and verse number 2 says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. This is a prophecy about Christ. He shall bring forth what? Judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. Was Christ marching and protesting in his day against oppression? Listen what this says. The desire of ages, page 509, it says, the government under which Christ lived was corrupt 
and oppressive. On every hand, we're crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned whom? The national enemies. Christ did not interfere with the authority of administration of those in power. He who was our example kept aloof from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men. Let's read now. But because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures to be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must do what? Regenerate the heart. Go to Matthew chapter 3 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Is Christ our example? And note this, John the Baptist is also our example. In the times when John the Baptist lived upon this earth, there was oppression. There was prejudice all throughout the land. But what was John the Baptist found doing? Because what he was found doing is what God has called Seventh-day Adventists to do. What was John found doing? He was found preaching the gospel, my friends. It is a gospel that both the oppressors and the oppressed need. Would you say amen? Look with me at Matthew chapter 3. Verse 1, underscore that. Verse 2, look what this statement says in the... The Desire of Ages, page 104, it says, When the ministry of John the Baptist began, let's read, The nation was in a state of excitement and discontent, verging on what? Does this sound like today? Verging on a revolution. The tyranny and extortion of the Roman governors and their determined Efforts to introduce the heathen symbols and customs kindled revolt, which had been quenched in the blood of how many? In the blood of thousands of the bravest of Israel. So since Israelites died at the hands of government officials, did John the Baptist say, let's stage a march and protest? Listen to what this says. All this intensified the national hatred against Rome and increased the longing to be freed from her power. Let's read. Amid discord and strife, a voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice startling and stern, yet full of hope. Repent ye, why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand with a new strange power, it moved the people to action and conversion. Would you say amen? amen? Chapter 14 of Revelation. Where are we going to, my friends? So now, do these things show the end of all things is at hand? And another issue which shows inequality, oppression, these things are ripe in society today, is the issue of income inequality, the grinding down of the poor by the powers that be. Is that going on right now, friends? As a result, what are the poorer class of people now doing? Don't tell me that you're not seeing what's going on in the media and around you. What are they now doing? Because as poor people, they are being grinded down. The middle class is being wiped out. What are people now doing? Young and old, they are marching and protesting. Friends, all these happened this week. Look at this, friends. CBS News, watch this. November 12th, it says, campus does what? Well, skip on down. It says, students, students at more than 100 colleges and where? Universities are staging marches for many reasons. One is what? They want what? They want a $15 per hour minimum wage. Are they marching and protesting? And these marches and protests, they are so effective. They are even affecting negatively Seventh-day Adventist institutions. Have you ever heard of Loma Linda? Listen to what this says, friends. It says Loma Linda University. Health, 
Does what, friends? Raises its minimum wage, not to $15 now, but to $13 an hour. What caused this? What caused Loma Linda, the president and the CEO, to respond to this? What, what causes, friends? The marches, the protests, don't forget this one, and the labor unions. Listen what this says. In a letter to Loma Linda University Health, its president and the CEO announced that it is adopting a what? Don't forget that. Adopting a living wage to ensure every employee may get that wage to support their family. Last sentence, the move comes amid, let's read, the move comes amid what? A push by what, friends? A California labor union to raise the state minimum wage to $15 an hour. So because the institution is connected to the government, do you see it now, friends? The labor unions, that God tell us to beware of labor unions, my friend. Ah, oh, beloved, that God give us an inspired messenger in the person of Ellen G. White. Can we not see what's going on, friends? Watch, this, these marches and protests, the media is telling us these things are historic in U.S. history. Watch this, friends. It says, The Guardian. Watch this. It says, headline, fight for what, friends? $15 per hour wage swells into largest protest by low-wage workers where? In the U.S. history. That tagline says right here, workers in more than 200 cities walked out on jobs or joined protest bankrolled by whom? By organized labor, labor unions on this past Wednesday in latest bid to raise minimum wage. And many people are now saying, people are taking different sides of the spectrum. Some are saying, we must raise the minimum wage up to $15 per hour. But others are saying, if you raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour, then thousands, yea, even millions of people who are now working will be what? Laid off from their jobs. And they are going to be even more deeply depressed in poverty. The next side says, well, do not raise it. And then comes the voice, if you don't raise it, thousands, yea, tens of millions will remain in poverty poverty and the poor will become poorer do you see it friends if you raise it trouble if you don't trouble do you see what's going on this must awaken our minds put on your think caps now it means then that's not the issue the raising or not raising because a man can make let's say seven dollars an hour and still be able, follow me, and still be able to take care of his family if the cost of living was not so high. So the issue is not, should we raise it or not raise it? The real question is, why is the cost of living so high? But nobody wants to talk about that issue. That God prophesied this would take place. Friends, I'm telling you, Ellen G. White was inspired. She said this would be the case. The men in leadership would be perplexed with the issues in the last days affecting our country. Listen to what this says. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 13 says, We are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare. What, friends? The coming of Christ is near at hand. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. How do we know God's Spirit is being withdrawn? It says, the calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society. Does that sound like today? It says, the alarms of war. Does that sound like today? Russia, America, Syria, Terrorism, does that sound like today? Bold robberies are of frequent occurrence. What are the next three words? Strikes are common. Does that sound like today, friends? We just read it. 
over 200 cities in America. People are marching, protesting, and striking. Do we not see where we are? It says, watch, it says uh, men are possessed with demons. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and what? Little children. What happened in Paris just a few hours ago? Though, listen now, those who hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problem of what things? Moral corruption, poverty, pauperism, and increasing crime. Let's read. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. Then, Sister White says, here is the solution. Let's read. If men would give more heed to the teaching of God's word, they would find a solution of the problems that perplex them. So where is the solution to be found? In the word of God, my friends. Do you know, friends, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should be able to proclaim from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy what the detailed solutions are to, to solve the problems that are perplexing the nations. My friends, if we were brought to stand before Congress, we should be able to say, Speaker of the House, and all these congressmen and women, even to the White House, this is how you solve these problems. Listen, the Daniel of past times solve the problems of Babylon. Was Babylon the world superpower of that day? Like America today. So where are the Daniels today, friends? Did jo oh yes, did Joseph solve the problems of Egypt? The world superpower of that day, like America. Where are the Daniels and the Josephs today? Did God tell us these things would happen? Friends, God gave us this book. And how many of you have this book at home, friends? It's called the Ministry of Healing. I brought this here just for emphasis. What is going on now? Perplexing America and the world. The solutions are right here in this book. This is why Satan says, oh, you don't need the spirit of prophecy. This is why Satan inspires men to say that Ellen G. White was not inspired. Because he knows if you throw away these books, then he can have free reign, free reign to both deceive and to destroy mankind. Now, you may read the whole book, but based on our context here, just focus on chapter 12 and 13 of this book. The 12th chapter titled, Help for the Unemployed and the Homeless. Help for whom, friends? The unemployed and the homeless. Is there coming a time when many of us who are now working will be unemployed and will be homeless? God told us these things would transpire and said, don't be afraid. Here are the steps to be preserved in that time. Will you go home and read it, my friends? Chapter 13 is entitled, The Helpless Poor. The helpless poor right here in the ministry of healing. So now this issue of raising the minimum wage or not raising it, this is an issue to destroy the economy of America. To raise it, folks become poorer. Don't raise it, folks become poorer. The issue is to destroy what, my friends? The economy of America. And guess who is calling for an increase of the minimum wage to $15 per hour? The Pope of Rome, my friends. Look at this. This is National Catholic Reporter. It says, raising the minimum wage, an economic and moral what? necessity among, listen carefully, among the many ways the Catholic Church strives to be vigilant for the common good is its call for a what? A living wage. Since Pope Leo XIII, 1891, encyclical titled on capital and labor. Let's read. Popes, who friends? 
popes have called for the right of all workers to receive wages sufficient to provide for their families. So who is calling for an increase of the minimum wage also? Pope Francis, wait a minute, wait a minute, friends. But to increase the minimum wage, what will happen to tens of millions of those who are now working? Since cost of living is still going up and taxes on businesses are still rising, what will happen to these people? They will lose their jobs and become poorer. That is one plus one equals two, my friends, to destroy the economy. If that is clear, say amen. But listen to this carefully now. Who is this present pope receiving his marching orders to call for an increase of the minimum wage? It says from which pope? From Pope Leo XIII. So now I scratch my head. I said, Lord, take me back to Pope Leo's encyclical on capital and labor and show me what he said. What is he calling for? What is the end goal? The objective of raising the minimum wage, well knowing it will destroy the economy, make the poor poorer, what is the end result? And we are told in the encyclical of Pope Leo XIII that the Sunday law will be enforced. I'm going to read some startling words for you, friends. You need to wake up. Pope Leo XIII who laid the foundation and every other pope follows. He says, we must force the people to keep Sunday. Force people to look at the church as their mother. Force people to partake of the sacraments, the Eucharist. Now, who could he be talking to? Catholics? No. They already keep Sunday. They already look at the church as the mother. So who is he talking to? He's talking to the world, the, the non-Catholics, even Protestants. Are you ready for it now, friends? It says, watch, this is, uh, watch, Pope Leo, the rights and duties of capital and labor. Point 41 says, from this follows, the obligation of the cessation from work and labor on what day? On Sundays uh, and certain holidays, uh, the rest from labor is not to be understood as mere giving way to idleness. Let's read. But it should be rest from labor hallowed by religion. You got that, friends? So this Sunday issue must be enforced by what? By religion. So it's not just rest, don't go to work. No, go to church. Which church? The Catholic church. Listen to what he says. His, and then he quotes Exodus 20, verse 8. He says, it is this above all, which is the reason a red motive of Sunday rest, a rest sanctioned by God's great law of the ancient covenant. Then he quotes Exodus 20, verse 8. Then he says, let, listen, let the working man be what? Wait a minute. Let the working man be urged and led to, to the worship of God, to the earnest practice of religion. And among other things, let them be urged to the keeping, what? Holy of Sundays and holy days. Let him learn to reverence and love a holy church, the common mother of us all. And hence, let them be urged to obey the precepts of what? The church and to frequent the sacraments. Do you see the objective of Pope Francis, my friends? Let's destroy the economy and then Sunday will be enforced. How close are we, my friends? Not only Pope Leo the 13th, but Pope Francis is also calling for what? A Sunday law to care for the poor. Question, did God prophesy? that Sunday will be called for to be enacted by law to care for the poor, that God said this would take place. Through whom? Through whom? Through Ellen White. That God give us a prophet, my friends, an inspired messenger, 
Great controversy. Page 590 confirms that. So now, since Sister White was right on this point, what else was she right on? Everything. Everything. <laughs> what else did she say? would take place in these last days, uh, signaling the close of probation and the second coming of Christ. She says, beware of the labor unions. Let's take our time on this now. Listen to what this says. This is a book called Country Living. Country what, friends? Page 9 and page 10. How many of you understand that we must reside in the countries, in rural districts in these last days? to get prepared for the little time of trouble. And some of you felt so uneasy a while ago because you love city living. Listen what this says. The trade, what friends? The trades unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as not been since what the world began. Think about this. What? Think now, think now. And this is a small example. What if these people who are marching and protesting strike from their jobs? When I ask you a question, will Walmart remain open for long? No. Will Publix remain open for long? Will your grocery stores remain open for long? Will you be able to buy bottled water for a long time? So what's going to happen, my friends? You won't be able to what? Buy or sell. Can you see what's coming, friends? So now, since these things are coming, God is telling us something. The trade unions will bring a time of trouble such as never was upon this earth. It's time for country living. And we can see evidences, uh, the marches, uh, the protests, and the riots. Probation's hour is fast closing. What more can I say, my friends? Oh, I get excited. Jesus is soon to come. I have no time to be fearful, but to be excited, my friends. All we must do is say, Lord, I believe it. I'm willing to be led. Lord, I yield. Just show me. Just lead me. Don't look at your bank account. That same book called Country Living says, if you are faithful to God, God will allow you to secure properties free of charge. Receiving it as a gift from the owners. If it's a gift, you don't buy it, my friends. That's what God's words say. No time for fear, my friends. It says, watch, the time is fast coming. Let's read. When the controlling power of the labor unions uh, will be very oppressive. What's happening to Loma Linda right now? Do you see it, friends? Listen now, again and again. In the same breath, again and again. Let's read. The Lord has instructed that our people must take their families away from the cities into where the country where they can raise their own provisions. Why? For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Do you not see it, my friends? Did God prophesy this through Ellen G. White? Now, is she inspired? Let's see now. What's going on, friends? Someone sent me this from Rochester, New York. A, a fairly new convert sent this by email. Pastor, look at this. And I smiled. Not because I saw the news report, but I saw a newly baptized person is now connecting the dots. Listen to what this says. For it said, what's the headline here, friends? Telegraph, Sunday, trading law reform would damage fabric of society. Skip on down, it says, watch, churches. Who, friends? Churches, trade unions, and whom? Retailers have claimed that changing Sunday Trading laws will undermine the fabric of society. They said keeping Sunday special is essential to the fabric of our society. They write. Then they said longer Sunday opening will have a, a dramatic effect on family life for no economic gain. So what are churches in connection with trade unions? And retailers calling for 
a Sunday rest. That God give us an inspired messenger in the person of Ellen G. White. Can we not see what's going on? And guess who else is calling for a Sunday rest? Just this week, look at what the Pope said, friends. He says, watch, he says, headline, if you have the right to work, you have the right to rest. Do you see, friends? If the government says you have, there is a law for you to work, then guess what? The government must also enact a law for you to rest. To rest on which day, my friends? How close are we then? to the enforcing of a Sunday law. And the sad reality is uh, God's people are unprepared. Listen, listen. We are just as unprepared as the ancient Israelites were when they went to war with the Philistines in Bible times. Hear me carefully. The war between the Israelites and the Philistines is a type of the war that God's people will encounter in these last days. When the mark of the beast is enforced, we will go up against Satan and his agents. The Bible tells us in the 12th chapter of the Revelation and verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman. Let's read that. Come on. And went to make war. With the remnant of her seed, which do what? Which keep the commandments of God and the testimony and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are we encountering the great war of the ages? First Samuel, go there with me, my friends. First Samuel chapter 4. Where are we going to, my friends? First Samuel chapter 4. The ancient Israelites, they were now encountering a war with the Philistines. And they were just unprepared as the majority of God's people are. As we are now seeing, the mark of the beast is near. The war of the great drama is about to take place. And God's people are unready. So here they are. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Are we here, my friends? The Bible tells us that the elders of Israel. Who, friends? The elders of Israel, along with Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, they went to, to war with those Philistines. And the Bible says they went and they fetched something and brought it into the camp of Israel, thinking that thing would bring them deliverance. What was that thing? They went to fetch the what? The Ark of the Covenant. Look with me, friends. Listen carefully. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? Verse number 1 speaks of the battle, the war. Verse number 2 says, uh, let's read verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel and went. And when they joined battle, Israel was what? Smitten before the, palace, be, before the Philistines. And they slew of the army of Israel in the field about 4,000 men. Verse 3 now says, And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before those Philistines? Let us fetch the what? The ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us that when it cometh among us, it may do what? It may save us. So what did they go to fetch, my friends? And they thought it would bring them salvation, bring them deliverance. It says it was the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant a symbol of? God's presence. God's what, my friends? But even though they brought the Ark of the Covenant in Israel, thinking that would save them. What happened to the elders of Israel, the people of Israel, with Hophni and Phinehas? What happened to them, my friends? They were slain in that war. Look with me at verse 10. Verse 10, are we there, my friends? Skip on down to verse 11. And the ark of God was taken, and the sons of Eli, Hophni, 
and Phineas were what? They were slain. You know what God showed me, my friends? They went to war, but they didn't bring the ark. And when they saw that they were smitten before the enemy, do you see it now? When they were staring death in the face, it was at that time they said, wait a minute. We went to war without the Ark of the Covenant. We are in war, but we don't have God's presence. Let's not go back and fetch the Ark to have God's presence among us. But even though they had the Ark of God's Covenant, a symbol of God's presence, God's presence was not with them. What is the application? Half nine. Phineas and those men, they represent a group of people in these last days. Ah, oh, friends. <laughs> they will come to the mark of the beast crisis. The great and final war. And realize, my brother, they don't have God's presence with them. And when they begin to steer now, Persecution in the face. When they begin to realize that imprisonment will be their lot. They can buy. They can sell. At that time, what will they begin to plead for? Pleading for God's presence. But at that time, it will be too late, my friends. Too late. Too late. At that time, the Bible says many will run to the north even to the east, to seek the word of God, but they shall not find it. They did not have God's presence. Look with me. First Samuel, first Samuel chapter three, or chapter four. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? Look with me now at verse 19. The Bible tells us that Phineas' wife on her deathbed made a certain statement. When she heard of half nine, and Phineas were slain in the war. When she heard the ark of God was taken, the Bible tells us in verse 20, verse 21, verse 22, the wife of Phineas said, Ichabod, the glory is departed. Look at verse 21. Are we there, my friends? It's, are we there? Go back with me. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And his daughter-in-law, what was her name? His daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with what? Child. Near to be what? Delivered. Pause right there. Go down to verse 21 now. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel. The ark of God is taken. Ichabod, the glory is departed from Israel. Oh, friends, I went back and I said, wait a minute. Eli had two sons. What were their names? Hophni and what? Phineas. But who gave the proclamation? Ichabod, the glory is departed from Israel. Not Hophni's wife, but Phineas's wife. Why was it her who gave the proclamation? Ichabod, the glory is departed. I looked up the word Phineas. You would not believe what Phineas means. Phineas means words coming from the lips of a snake. The wife of a snake. Oh, my friends. The wife of a symbol of the devil. She did not declare Ichabod. The glory is departed from Israel. She was only echoing what God had already said. It's God who said, Ichabod, we shall see. The glory is departed. Now the wife of Phineas said, Ichabod, showing it was uh, Satan now speaking through her. After Satan had used and abused the Israelites, Hophni and Phineas, then he was smiling and laughing at them. Ichabod, God has rejected you. The glory is departed. 
And when this was heard, what happened, my friends, to Eli? When he heard the ark was taken from them in the field of war. What happened to Eli, friends? It says Eli was on that chair when he heard his sons were slain. But specifically, the ark of God was taken from them into the hands of the heathens. It says he fell off his chair and what? And broke his neck, Eli. So who does Eli represent today, my friend? Ichabod, the glory is departed. And what God showed me was this, that war only manifested what had already taken place in the camp of the Israelites. God's presence was not with them before the war. Wow. Wow. And that war with the Philistines, it typifies the mark of the beast, the national Sunday law crisis. And the majority of God's people have already rejected God's presence. Ichabod, let me say it this way, Ichabod, the glory is departed. But friends, how could that be so? When they had the Ark of the Covenant with them, they had the symbol but not the experience. Just like many today, we have uh, the symbols of Christianity, but we lack the true experience of Christianity. Bible conversion. May I ask you a question? Did they have the ark of God with them? But did they lack God's presence? Question, what items, oh, talk to me. What items were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, in the box? Give me one. All right, Ten Commandments. So did they have the physical two tables of stone in the Ark? But did they have God's presence? So my friends, they represent people in the last days. Do you see it now? They are professing, we know God's Ten Commandments, but they don't have God's presence. Presence. Ichabod, the glory is departed. What else was in that ark? Talk to me. They had the golden pot of manna, which points to what, friends? The word of God. They represent people in the last days who profess we have our Bibles. We even have the spirit of prophecy. But what do they lack? They have the symbols, my friends, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, but they lack the experience of Jesus Christ in their hearts. Ichabod, the glory, is departed. What else was in that ark, my friends? It's time to examine ourselves. Aaron's rod that budded. Write down on your paper there. Let me give you the text. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through verse 5, lists all these items that were in the ark. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through verse number 5, Aaron's rod that budded. What was Aaron's rod that budded symbolized? The chosen vessel, Aaron, the tribe from Aaron. I have chosen them to, to be my priest. The leaders of the people, this represent people in the last days who are priding themselves saying, we are God's chosen people. We are Seventh-day Adventists, having the symbol but don't have the experience, the presence of Jesus Christ. So may I say it one more time? Ichabod. The glory is departed. Your name cannot save you, my friends. Tell me, what else was in the ark? The golden censer. Amen. And what was the golden censer for? What was the golden censer for? As the incense would arise. Prayers, my friends. So this represents, they had the censer. In the Ark of the Covenant, but they lack the presence of God. They represent people in the last days who profess to be praying to God, but they have a form of godliness, rejecting 
the presence, the power of the Holy Ghost, Ichabod. The glory is departed. Go with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2, friends. Let's reverse. Let's take a look at what led to this cry. Ichabod, the glory is departed because that glory left them. God's presence left them long before the war started with Israel and the Philistines. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Are we there, my friends? It says in verse number 12, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. And what are the next five words? They knew not the Lord. What does that mean, friends? But were they operating in the office as a pastor, as a priest, as an elder in the church? Sons of Belial. Oh, Lord, have mercy. What a title. Sons of Belial. Yet Eli allowed them to remain as preachers, as pastors, as leaders in the church. Sons of Belial, I wonder. Who does Eli represent today, friends? Eli represents parents. May I read something for you, friends? Because if we as parents choose to please our children in sin and displease God, very, very soon we shall hear with a loud voice, a still small voice saying, Ichabod, you have rejected my presence. Listen to what this statement says. I'm quoting Patriarchs and Prophets, page 575. It says, but although he had been appointed to govern the people, Eli did not rule his own household. Eli was an indulgent father, loving peace and ease. He did not exercise his authority to correct the evil habits and passions of his children. Rather than contend with them or punish them, he would submit to their will and give them their own way. Eli, that's why the man fell and broke his neck. Ichabod. The glory is departed. Are you an Eli today, friends? Are you an Eli today? These things were written for our admonition. Go back to verse number 12. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Eli also represents church administrators. Wow, my friend. Knowingly, they know these pastors are in apostasy. But they still allow these pastors to remain as overseers of the church. Why does Christ label them as the sons of Belial? Do you know who Belial was? A heathen God. Do you know who his how his children were described? They were described as people drinking wine and becoming drunk. Look with me, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Do you, remember, do, you remember, do you remember Anna? She was praying, couldn't hear a voice, but her lips were moving. And Eli said, come on, stop drinking wine and getting drunk. And what said Anna in response? Verse 16, count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. So Eli's sons, sons of Belial, they were called, they were drinking wine, drunk. Who do they represent today, friends? Pastors who are drinking wine, literally. Because some of them do drink wine, liquor, alcohol. Ichabod, the glory is departed. But what are the wine? In a spiritual sense, are they drinking, friends? The wine of Babylon, which represent false doctrines. And the Eli's of today knowingly know that they are preaching damnable heresies in the church and allow them to remain in those churches. Ichabod, the glory is departed. How is it a pastor can stand up and say, Allah is 
is the God of Christians and the God of Seventh-day Adventists. How could that be, my friends? How could pastors remain in the pulpits all around Seventh-day Adventism who are preaching the false theories of contemplative prayer, NLP, spiritual formation in the schools, in the pulpits, and what do, what do they do? They give them accolades and ordinations and prizes and more increase of pay. Ichabod, the glory is departed. Lord have mercy. And those who sit under Eli's sons will also reject God's presence. Ichabod, the glory is departed. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look at verse 22. The Bible tells us, listen friends, this is what led to the cry. Ichabod, the glory is departed. Verse 22 says, Eli's sons, they were committing fornication. Adultery in the church. And do you know, friends, there are many pastors within seven-day Adventism who were caught committing adultery and fornication? And what did the modern Eli's? They moved them from one church to the next church, somewhere else. Ichabod, the glory is departed. And if pastors can do that and still sit there and get a tap on the shoulder, never mind, keep on preaching then what will the people in the pews do? For by beholding you become changed. That's why they grieve God's Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter how many souls are, are won. God is winning those souls in spite of those apostate pastors. Verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the woman that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of, we are friends, of the church. And verse 24, Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear you make the Lord's people to what? The Lord's people to transgress. So what was the condition of Hophni and Phinehas? Were they sons of Belial, my friends? Committing adultery, not only physically. Oh, my friends. What do women represent in prophecy? So what is the application, friends? When pastors are inviting the Babylonian pastors to come and preach in seven-day Adventist pulpits. Ichabod, the glory is departed. And they are preaching the false doctrines of Babylon. We are inviting the choirs from Babylon to come and sing within Adventism. When Paul says, if we are going to sing, we must sing with the Holy Spirit and sing with the understanding also. If they do not understand our doctrines, how can they sing and give us a message? When songs must have the message, Ichabod, the glory is departed. We bring their books into our schools, their writings into our Sabbath school lesson guide, Ichabod. The glory is departed. You haven't heard anything yet. What were they doing in verse 22? They were sleeping with the woman in the church. And what were they called in verse 12? Talk to me. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Do you know how the sons of Belial were also labeled? And what their condition was? The Bible tells us the sons of Belial were also homosexuals. Hold your place in in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Hold your place right there. Judges chapter 19. Go there with me. Why would God give them this title, friends? The sons of Belial. And then God says, the way, the way how we arrive at truth 
is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. They were called sons of Belial, not by accident. Not only were they committing adultery physically and spiritually, they were also leading out in homosexuality and allowing homosexuality to be brought into the church. Judges chapter 19. Where are we going to, my friends? Judges chapter 19. Look with me here at verse number 16. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? It speaks about the people of Benjamin in verse 16. Are we there, my friends? Now skip on down to verse 22. It says, now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. Not know him by shaking his hand. What's your name? No, friends. Adam knew his wife and brought forth a man child. We want to know him, sons of Belial, my friends. So now, when we can see a pastor standing up at PUC University, and say that Adam and Steve together, nothing is wrong with that. Sons of Belial, Ichabod, the glory is departed, friends. Oh, my friends, it's probation soon to close. The sons of Belial are here. Look with me. First Samuel chapter 2. Bible now says, God sent a man to warn Eli of what was coming. Look with me here. First number 28 of 1 Samuel 22. Skip on down to verse 29. This was Eli's first call to repentance. Verse 29. Are we there, my friends? The man of God said to Eli, Wherefore, kick you at my what? Sacrifice and at mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me. Wait a minute. What were they doing, friends? They were kicking against God's sacrifices and God's offerings. What could this mean, my friends? The sacrifices and the offerings pointed to whom? To Christ Jesus his ministry. So what were they doing in type? They were removing the principles of truth pertaining to the coming Messiah and his ministry. Do we now hear ministers saying there's no such thing as a heavenly sanctuary? There's no such thing as 1844. These are the sons of Belial kicking against God's sacrifice when the president can stand up and say, the mark of the beast based on scripture is any other day of worship than the seven-day Sabbath. What is going on here, my friends? When men are now saying, we don't know who the Antichrist is. They are kicking against God's sacrifices. They are destroying, putting aside the things that point to Christ, his ministry, and his work. Ichabod. Oh, friends, I say it with no apology. Ichabod, the glory is departed. Look with me at verse number 17. Verse number 16, the Bible says, the sons of Belial, the Bible says that they were forcing the people to give them offering. What would that represent today? The priests were forcing the people to give them offering. Verse 16, verse 17, the last phrase of verse 16 says, if you don't give it to me, I will take it by force. What is the application, friends? Are church men not bullying pastors? If you preach present truth, we will terminate you. Ichabod, the glory is departed. Did the president 
and his men bully David Gates? Yes. Did they marginalize Doug Batchelor? It's bullying among us, my friends. Ichabod, the glory is departed. I say it with no apology, my friends. We are here. Our ministers now saying, if you go to certain churches, we are going to disfellowship you. What is that? Bullying. And they say, if you don't bring your tithes and your offerings here, and we will force you to do so, we are going to disfellowship you. Ichabod, the glory is departed. So now, with all these sins going on in the church, how did that small, faithful few react to Eli, Hophni, and the sins of Phinehas? The Bible tells us they stopped going to church. And they stopped bringing their offerings to the temple. What, pastor? Yes, why? Because God's presence was not there. Listen to what this says. Look with me at verse 17. Verse 17. 1 Samuel 2, verse 17. Are we there, my friends? It says, wherefore, the sin of the young man was, the young men were very great before whom? The Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Listen to what this says now in Patriarchs and Prophets. Page 5, 7, 6, it says, uh, the irreverence, let's read what, come on, what it says. This irreverence on the part of the priest soon robbed the service of its holy and solemn significance and the people did what, friends? Listen now, these unfaithful priests also transgress God's law and dishonored their sacred office by their vile and degrading practices, yet they continued to pollute by their presence the tabernacle of God. Many of the people filled with indignation at the corrupt course of Hophni and Phinehas ceased to come up to the appointed place of worship. Did they stop going to the temple? Did they stop bringing their offerings to that temple? Why? Ichabod. The glory is departed when Hophni and Phinehas, sons of Belial, began to bring in homosexuality in the temple. People stopped going to churches. Is the NAD, North American Division, making steps to now make the LGBT movement a safe, have a safe place in our church? Is the Northern, the Netherlands, the NUC conference doing likewise, friends? This is Ichabod, my friends. The glory is departed, Father in heaven. Oh, dear God, work upon our hearts and minds today. Help us, dear God, not to miss what you're saying to us. In Christ's name we pray. Look with me. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look what God said to Eli now in verse number 30. God said to Eli in this first warning, Eli, I once said, your house will stand before me forever. Listen. But Eli, be far from me. I will cut off and cut down your house. What is the application here, friends? Many of us say, God will never remove his presence from Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, Lord, talk to us. Eli, I once, let's read that. Verse 30, wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that your house, Eli, and the house of thy father, Eli, should walk before me for how long? Forever, but now. The Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come, Eli, I will cut off your arm. Cut down your house. What is the application, friends? Does the Bible teach one safe, always saved? 
Yet how many of us believe just because we were once baptized that we are sealed for heaven? God said, yes, Eli, I once said, your house will stand before me forever. But since you have rejected me, since you have served men and pleased men and not me, be it far from me. I will cut you down. What is God saying to us, friends? Oh, my Lord, have mercy upon us. This is what I call the first angel's message, his first warning. Guess through whom the second warning came? It came through Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? Where are my young people? Raise your hand, young people, and young at heart. Raise your hand, my youth. Amen. Do you know? Hear me. When the men of Eli, sons of Belial, were in apostasy, Rejecting God. Do you know who God began speaking to? The young people, a child, a youth, a young man called Samuel. Wow. What an application. While the leaders and pastors and elders, most of them are in apostasy. It's a sign now, my young people. Jesus wants to speak to you directly. The Samuels. But oh, if God wants to speak to a young man, a young girl, and make them his messenger, his missionary, but the parents are like Eli. Oh, my Lord. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto God before Eli. Listen now. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Wait a minute right there. This is when God calls Samuel. And the Bible says the word of God was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Who receives visions? The prophets. The prophets. So why was there no open vision? Oh, my friends, there was no vessel that God could use to give his message to give to the people. And guess what? God skipped over the pastors and the elders because they were in apostasy. And God now raised up Samuel to be his prophet. Have you ever read Acts 2? I will pour out my spirit upon your sons and all oh, and your daughters. They shall prophesy. Samuel, that's why I'm giving my utmost attention to you young people. You are the Samuels today. The word of God was precious in those days. What do you think that word means? Precious. It means rarity. It was scarce. Scarce, my friends, look with me. Verse number two, and it came to pass at that time when Eli, listen, was laid down in his place. Let's read now. And Eli's eyes began to wax dim and he could not see. So what was the condition of Eli when God began calling Samuel? The man, man's eyes began to grow dim. What's the application? The leaders, the parents of today, their eyes are going to go dim. Get dim. They are going to be spiritually blind. But who will have spiritual eyesight? The Samuels of today. Not only the literal youth, because Samuel was a youth, but Samuel a youth. A child also represents those who will come into the faith in these last days. Those who are born again. And they grab hold of the present truth. And like Samuel, they, they will be faithful to God's call upon their lives. Eli's eyes began to grow dim. What is the condition of Laodicea? They are wretched, miserable, 
poor and what? Blind, my friends. It's God calling for Samuel's today. Look with me, friends. What was the call from the wife of Phineas? Ichabod. The what, friends? The glory is departed. It was heard in the war. The war typifies the national son, the law. But there was Ichabod before that. Look at verse 3. Ready, my friends? When God called Samuel, verse 3, and Ur, the what, friends? The lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel, oh, friends, do you see it now? So what was going on in the temple when God called Samuel? The lamp of God went out. If you read Exodus 27, and the book of Leviticus 24, the lamp should never go out in the sanctuary. The lamp should burn continually before the Lord. The lamp should never go out, my friends. So what was going on? Leviticus 24, verse 1 to verse 4. Leviticus 24, verse 1 to verse 24. So what happened? In the temple, when God began to call Samuel, the light went out in the church. What, what must cause the lamp to give its light? Oil. oil. And what is the oil a symbol of? Of mercy. The Holy Spirit. So what was going on in the church? Oh, my friends. And what was in the temple then, verse 3? The lamp went out. In God's temple, where the ark of God was, what did they bring with them to the battle? The ark of God, but who was not there? Ichabod before the war, my friends. Ichabod, the glory is departed. And God began to speak to Samuel. Did God call him, my friends? Listen, listen. When God called Samuel, did Samuel Recognize the voice. Listen to me carefully. It represents ministers in the last days who neglect to teach the young people how to hear God's voice. Wow. It represents parents today. Friends, as a minister, as parents, we must so teach our children to hear God's voice. And the second call came to him. He ran to Eli and watched Eli go back and sleep. What's the application? God is waking up the young people to live for him. And the adults, the pastors, go back to sleep. You're too earnest. You're too aggressive. You're trying to be too spiritual. Go back to sleep. Eli, go back to sleep. And what is the application? Our young people are saying, I will no longer wear jewelry. But the ministers say, it's okay. A wedding band, a wedding ring, it's okay. Just be modest. Don't put on too much ornaments. We want to eat right, follow healthy form. But what are the ministers saying? And the parents. Jesus ate fish. <laughs> Eli's, my friends. They don't want worldly music. We want to stand for God. But the ministers are saying, nothing is wrong. It's your culture. Eli's my friends they want to preach the present truth they want to identify who Babylon is but the pastor say you are so intolerant go back to sleep but now the third call came to Samuel praise God friends. listen 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 God will never stop calling until you can recognize his voice and God showed me this. The third call came to Samuel. He ran to Eli. And Eli said, now, wait a minute. 
three calls? This must be God. Because Eli was once called. He understood how the call comes. If you don't hear once, that God of creation will call again. And if you don't hear the second time, he will call again. He's the good shepherd, my friends. He's calling the sheep. If any man hears my voice, Jesus is calling, my friends. The Savior is calling. Will you answer the call today? Not Samuel now. Andrew. Put your name there. While you're fast asleep, put your name there, Hillary. Put your name there, Christian. Put your name there, Faith. He's calling our names, my friends. And you know what, my friends? Many times when we're fast asleep in the mornings, guess who's calling us? Jesus. He wants us to get up. Why? To spend time with him. As we spend time with him, then we have strength to make it through that day. God is calling us, friends. Wake up out of our sleep. Go now. If you hear that voice again, Samuel, say, speak, Lord. I'm going to close right here. Speak, Lord. Thank you. I never saw this. Thank you, Jesus. Do you know how much God loves you? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. He would tell Samuel that. Speak. Your servant hears. And yet when God spoke to Eli, he heard but refused to obey. Eli represents people today. So quick to tell people. Surrender to God. But they themselves refuse to surrender to Jesus when he called. And he keeps on calling Jesus. He keeps on knocking. And God spoke to Samuel and listen. In the morning, Eli said, son, what did God say to you? Isn't it something? He was willing now to listen to a boy than to listen to God himself. Oh, my friend. And Samuel was somewhat timid, right? But God moved upon his heart. And he said, Eli, Ichabod, your house is departed. Your house will fall. So what message then was Samuel preaching in the context of those three angels? He was preaching a second angel's message. And what says that second angel? Babylon is what? Fallen. He's fallen. Listen, that's for the world, right? But there is an application for seven-day Adventists. Ichabod, the glory is departed. Do you know what Eli said now? He said, whatever God wants to do, let him do it. Have mercy. Whatever, he, whatever God says, let him do it. Before he repented, he was still standing there saying, whatever God said, let him do it. He heard, probation is about to close the eye. Your second call. Why two calls? Whenever God sends a message two times, it means certainty. Certainty. And before Eli surrendered, it was not yet too late. So what? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, friends. Because some of us are saying, so what? So what? I've heard that before. Wow. Somebody came and said the same thing. I'm still here. So what? Lord, have mercy upon us. How are you going to respond to God today, friends? There is an application of this in Jeremiah 7. God said to Jeremiah, stop praying for Israel. Look at what I did to Shiloh 
with Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, stop praying for them. If it happened in Jeremiah 7, years after Eli, it's going to happen again. So what? Friends, is so what your response today? Oh, my friends. Lord, help us. Is so what your response to God today, friends? If you say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, thank you for giving me another opportunity. Slip out of your seat right now and come right down to the front. Let's have a season of prayer. A prayer of dedication of our hearts to God. One of consecration to God today. But if you are saying, so what? Stay where you are, friends. Stay where you are. Don't get up. Stay right where you are. Even those online, what will be your response to God today? So what? Don't play with God. He's knocking today giving you one more opportunity. If you won't hear it from a man, a grown man, I'm going to send to you a youth. No excuse. No excuse. The Savior's calling, friends. Will you surrender all to God today? Song leader, sister, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever Love and trust him. In his presence, I would daily live. So when I find myself in a crisis, I won't have to go fetch his presence. Oh, my friends. Why? Because daily I'm in his presence, my friends. They failed. They left God's presence. Poor Eli. So what? Bold in God's face. So what? So what? And some of you have the same spirit right now. So what? It's time to surrender, my friends. All to Jesus. Oh, yes. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father in heaven,